One of the problems that we have in our city is we haven't let them evolve. Right. Uh, we basically frozen them in time. The city of St. Paul in the 1970s essentially downzoned the entire city where something like 75% of all of the land that you could build a house on was exclusively single family homes. Exactly. Fast forward 60 years and everyone's like, you know, why is it expensive to live here? It's like, well, you know, we've been building 40 new houses a year, max. Meanwhile, you know, you've got this demand for jobs, demand for population, et cetera, et cetera. So just allowing to create a framework that will allow things to develop organically or more organically, I think is going to be a big win for everybody. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is my good friend, Nate Hood from St. Paul, Minnesota. And we are going to be talking about uh, his comedy routine. He is a stand-up comic, uh, trying to get some urbanism stuff uh, wiggled into his uh, onstage routine. And we'll also talk a little bit about the work that he does there in that area, especially uh, along the lines of the role he plays on Planning Commission. So let's get right to it with Nate. Nate Hood, good to see you again. Welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, John. <laughs> well, you know what I do? I, I like to give the floor over to my guests to, you know, allow them an opportunity to take 30 seconds to uh, introduce themselves. So uh, who the heck is Nate Hood? <laughs> you know, my name is Nate Hood. I'm a, I'm a planner. Uh, that's what I do with my day job. I'm a planning commissioner. I'm a dad. I have two kids. And I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm Moonlight is a stand-up comedian. So that so that's really my background. I've John, I've known you for over a decade now, as you've reminded me. Yeah. Um, so it's great to chat with you. And it's always fun when someone says, Hey, do you want to do a podcast? You you kind of internally think, what do I know that would be interesting to anyone to listen to? So hopefully we can get a few few good nuggets out of it. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it, it really is amazing when I think back to, uh, you know, the 2012 sort of era and all of that. And we first got connected back in, in that sort of era. And then 2013, I did my big Northern Midwest, uh, active towns tour, uh, swung through your town and spent some time with you. Uh, back then you were doing a lot of writing with the strong towns organization. And I was on my way up to Brainerd to meet up with Chuck Marone and, and uh, have my first interview on his podcast uh, back in 2013. Yeah, what have you been up to since then? <laughs> Dude, you know, you, you stayed with me two houses ago. Yeah. Uh, I have, I'm have married, I have two kids, and just kind of trucking along. And kind of once the pandemic happened, I was like, you know what? One of my hobbies is stand-up comedy. I've always, uh, I did a little bit right after college, but I'm like, you know what? Let's just get back into it. So uh, I've really kind of dove into that. And that's really taken place from any of the ri good writing that I would have done for Strong Towns. Uh, now I spend my time writing jokes about essentially being a dad. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, and you just mentioned uh, a, a couple houses ago. And of course, uh, when I was staying with you all, uh, I think it was even before you were engaged. I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, when you got engaged, uh, you guys had some fun with it and, and you did this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, our, uh, engagement photos went viral. We did, we noticed that everybody took photos of great urban streetscapes or beautiful scenery, like in, in the rural countryside. Yeah. So, uh, when I say we, I said, Hey, why don't we do suburban <laughs> engagement photos? And, uh, they ended up going viral. They, uh, it's, it's funny, I still see them pop up every now and again, and people will still bring it up. I was on Reddit maybe like a few few months ago, and someone was like, look at these, somebody did some <laughs> I was just like, how are you even finding this stuff? Um, but yeah, this, oh, yeah. Was a, this was a dude, dude, the same way I found it. All you have to do is Google <laughs> suburban engagement photo. <laughs> You know, I'm surprised more people don't do it now. Um, you know, what's funny is somebody said on this one recently, yeah. um, one of the comments was, that's unfair. It's a new development. The trees haven't even grown in. Right. So I actually went back there yeah. and it turned out all the trees had died. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it actually looks worse. <laughs> right, that's hilarious. Oh, Let's yeah, zoom out on We'll zoom out on this one and there, there, the, you can see the scraggly little tree here. And, uh, uh, I like this, uh, this one here is, is classic. 
<laughs> the long shot. <laughs> yeah, the undeveloped suburban cul-de-sac. So you were obviously sort of making fun about the suburban context and 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 all of that. But what was I mean? It, your your delightful uh, fiance and now wife, uh, you know, you said it was your idea, but she went ar- along with it <laughs> begrudgingly. <did>. For- <laughs> you know, honestly, we were we were actually going from our cityscape location to our rural countryside location for photos, and like pull over right there. So those photos have taken up. Uh, I probably had more internet traffic in my life related to that, and those photos took us maybe ten minutes. Yeah. Our uh, wedding, our uh, our photographer, who is my sister-in-law, she takes photos all the time and nobody's seen more photos of hers than those. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it was just really one of these things that kind of popped into our heads. It was one of those like aha moments as we were kind of going from the city to the country. And that was nobody takes photos there. And, you know, really, this obviously goes at some of the things I was writing at the time, which is you know, we should build and live in places that uh, people want to take photos, where people want to take photos. Yeah. And we, you had mentioned that you were writing at the time. Uh, was that sort of the, 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 the genre or the, the zeitgeist of the stuff that you were writing uh, for, for Strong Towns at the time? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm still kind of obsessed with most things Strong Towns. That is, you know, building financial resiliency, building great walkable places uh, that people can genuinely love. That really just kind of fit in. I've always tried to do like little fun, weird, quirky things. uh, And that was it. Try to kind of break through the normal. I mean, we've read, how many articles have you read that walkable places are good, right? Like I was like, let's try to take like a different angle on that and uh, do something a little different, something playful, something fun. Yeah. I think one of the ones that you had done was, uh, was this one. Uh, it, it should be about people and talking, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, duh. <laughs> it should be about people. We should be designing people or, you know, places around people. And, and this, of course, is the, the per, uh, rendering of one of the proposed uh, Viking stadiums and talking about livability. And it, it should be centered around people and not around you know, whatever the hell else we're doing these things around. <laughs> it's like moving automobiles. And <laughs> so, yeah. If you want to bring that photo back up, uh, we would be based on what we got, man, that stadium that you're looking at now would have been real nice. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a good one. <laughs> yeah. You know, instead they uh, talk about places for people. Uh, three of the four sides of the Viking stadium are like black zinc oxide panels that you okay. just come in and it just looks they made it look like a, a a Viking ship, like an old Viking ship for the Vikings. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you've got a large, dark, ominous, uh, makeshift Viking ship made of black panels as you enter downtown. Might be intimidating to the opposite team. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think they can make their way past that. I think they have, as NFL players, I'm pretty sure they're confident to the point. And here's what's great about large sports stadiums too, right? So they build in like the bare minimum kind of urbanist uh, uh, sidewalks, street trees. They build even a bike path. And you're like, okay, great. We're getting something out of this. And then uh, five years later, for safety reasons, they just fence it all off. So you can't can't even like – so unless it's game day, like you can't even really walk on it. So – Anyways, fun, fun with uh, large stadiums, you know, every city's got a story on it too. So we're not alone. It's interesting that you should mention that too, because uh, you and I would cross paths frequently at the, uh, the annual gathering of the Congress for new urbanism. It's been a couple years since I've seen you there. Um, And in fact, I think the last time I saw you at a Congress for new urbanism was in 2019, uh, the year prior to the pandemic hitting, of course, 2020, you all were going to be hosting the the Congress for New Urbanism in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then it didn't happen, obviously, because of the pandemic, which was really, really tragic. And I know it was a, a tough blow to you guys because you as the local host committee, you had put a lot of work into to making that happen. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I want to stick with the stadium uh, concept. Last year um, at Charlotte, it was really cool to see 
uh, that integration of the stadium with the downtown area. And you mentioned uh, a bike path. And you know that I host the morning fun runs at the Congress for New Urbanism on Thursday and Friday morning, typically. And uh, there was a wonderful bike path that literally takes you right to the stadium. And in fact, it's totally integrated uh, the the bicycle connections and the pedestrian connections to that stadium. So uh, Charlotte, you know, thumbs up. You guys did it right. There really is some really good integration with that. And there's not this huge sea of parking uh, surrounding it. So they did a pretty darn good job. I was happy to see that at last year's Congress. Well, good job, Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. So, yeah, let's let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about that that tragedy that kind of happened uh, of y'all not being able to host, because I was really looking forward to that. You and I were sort of uh, chatting a little bit about maybe uh, doing a, a bike ride that would go from St. Paul all the way into Minneapolis. And we were at the early stages. Uh, yeah, that had to have been, a, a, you know, a, a bit of a letdown for you guys. You know, it, it was a, it was a big letdown from all the things that could happen during uh, the COVID pandemic. You know, it's not not a huge problem. But that being said, you know, if you're on the host committee, you're spending a year, year and a half before that event even happens, just doing everything from securing venues to setting up programming, coming up with themes, trying to coordinate bus drivers to take people on bus tours to different parts of the town. Uh, it's a lot of work, and uh, I think a lot of us felt like the rug was kind of pulled out from under us. And I think, obviously, it's 2020, right? So, uh, you know, that was kind of unfortunate, and it, it felt like a little bit of a blow. But uh, what can you do? I think we've all kind of moved on, and uh, you kind of – I think it really kind of taught me to roll with the punches on these things. You know, there's some things that are out of your control, and you just got to make the best of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and this topic has come up a, a few times, as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> on the podcast is that, yeah, you, you never know when a pandemic is going to happen. And when it does happen, you're out of control. You just got to roll with it. And and honestly, this this podcast it is a manifestation of the fact that, you know, the documentary that I was filming at the time came to an absolute abrupt halt. And I just had to, uh, 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 you know, pivot and do something new. And I pivoted and, and started the podcast a year later, uh, started the YouTube channel. And here we are having this conversation on YouTube. Yeah. It's a uh, silver lining, man. Silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you had mentioned earlier that, uh, you spend a little bit of time, uh, doing this, your alter ego getting up on stage. So I was going to ask you that question. You sort of, uh, you know, already put it out there is that you did a little bit of stand up back in college. That's right. I did a little uh, right out of the gate, just uh, something I always loved. And then I took a pause on it because uh, I didn't have a car at the time and it was impossible to get to shows and you wouldn't know. So nobody wants to spend two hours in transit in Minneapolis just to figure out they got turned down for a three minute spot. Right. But, you know, what I found is the scene has completely changed. You got shows all over. And uh, really the pandemic uh, really kind of sparked me to get back into really what I enjoyed doing. And that was telling jokes about my life. Yeah. I'm still trying to find a good way to incorporate city planning into that. Okay. You know, I'm on the planning commission and I test out a little material there, but sometimes I feel like I'm the only person in a conditional use permit hearing trying to crack jokes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I love that. Dude, I made some bad ones, man. You got to make sure that the, okay, to make a joke work as a planning commissioner, yeah, you need to make sure that the applicant is going to be approved. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you hate to crack a joke and you're like, I'm sorry, you know, you can't build your dream house. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, so it's kind of fun. something I learned. Uh, it, it's funny too, because when you, th- when you talk about urban issues and, you know, from an urbanism perspective and from a planning and zoning perspective. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you and I and, and you know, we could be hanging out with a whole bunch of urbanists and we'll find all sorts of funny, uh, you know, jokes and insider things and, and all that. Uh, but, y- yeah, you don't you don't know, you know, how that's going to go over when you talk about urban issues and city issues and things like that. 
How has the, I, I get the sense that you've, you've tested the waters a little bit on stage with some of these things, and I'm going to play a video clip of, of, of some of that, but talk a little bit about your mind and how it's working and as you're structuring jokes and saying, you know, I, I want to, I want to try to work in, you know, this, 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 uh, you know, urbanist issue that's trending right now on, on X on Twitter and Maybe see see if it floats and see if it works on in a general audience because when obviously when you're on stage you've you, it's not like you're on stage at CNU where you have a whole bunch of peers and a whole bunch of folks that are going to be like oh yeah totally I get that inside joke have, have, how's that gone when you're when you've tested some of those waters it's gone how very funny poorly. is urbanism <laughs> it's not it's not funny at all it's gone very poorly. Uh, <laughs> And I think the reason is you got to find things that like can universally connect with people, right? So I'll tell a dad joke, not like a dad joke, dad joke, but a joke about me being a dad. Yeah. Now, you know, someone might not be a dad, but they understand the concept of what it's like to have young children, whether or not they have it or not. So you can kind of find a way to relate on that. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of nuanced kind of urbanist issues, it takes a, it takes a long setup. And the thing with like, let's just say you're doing a standard setup punch joke. Right. You want that setup to be as short as possible because you want people to laugh. So you got to, you got to create the straightest line through to that laugh. Right. Right. And if you have to spend a lot of time explaining the city's 2040 comprehensive bike plan, right. You know, you're going to lose people. Right. <laughs> and also a lot of planning, a lot of planning is, um, a lot of it is political. I try to avoid political material. I try to avoid political and dirty material in the comedy that I do. Sometimes it slips in, but like that's not the purpose of it. Right. When you do that, you can split rooms. So if you go to CNU and you want to do something about urbanism, you know that everybody's more or less on your side or they understand the premise before you even say it, right? They would understand it. So well, you and, you can, and they would also stuff. understand being made fun of themselves. Correct. Because Correct. there's plenty of stuff that we can make fun about urbanists. Yeah. Like, you know, you're, you know, you know, yeah. you're on vacation or in a place where there's a whole bunch yeah. of urbanists because they're pulling out their camera and they're taking photos of streets. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah. Like my wife says that all the time. Like I'll, we'll be walking. I'll be like, wow, this is a really nice 10 foot sidewalk, you know? And she's like, why are you, why are you talking about this? <laughs> Or else, like, we'll be, we'll just be going somewhere. I'll be like, that should really be a bi directional bike way. She's just like, I have, she's like, oh, geez. So one of uh, one of the things that uh, that I noticed from this clip here is you sort of you know pull in the the zeitgeist of being proud of where you're at and and being able to poke poke fun at uh, other places and so let's uh, let's turn the volume up and and play this little video clip here and uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was funny. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be up here properly. Uh, and actually, it's a pleasure to be here in downtown St. Paul. I, uh, I love St. Paul. It is a little boring. Nobody in this room. St. <laughs> Paul is so boring that one time somebody saw a raccoon on a building and the entire city shut down. <laughs> it was the biggest thing we'd ever seen. I remember that day vividly, and it was such a big deal that I was down at the courthouse and the judge let us off jury duty. <laughs> Justice can wait. There's a raccoon on the building. Not like his double homicide's going anywhere. I think that people love that story. They were like affectionate for that story and they love that story. But what they don't know is that it had a tragic end. After they caught it, they relocated it to Minneapolis. Dun, dun, dun. The raccoon was like, it could have just shot me. <laughs> I I, for, I totally forgot about that joke. I forgot about that joke. I, I think what, what was funny is it is kind of an urbanism kind of joke because it, it, it's 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 a it's poking fun at, at St. Paul for being boring. And then, you know, and then the real punchline at the end is, yeah, but at least it's not Minneapolis. <laughs> so and, and obviously there's this sibling competition that exists between the ten, Twin Cities. Uh, so, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, what's how, how long have you been uh, sort of, you know, residing in the Twin Cities area and, you know, been a part of, you know, kind of that that sort of zeitgeist between, you know, the two different cities? You know, about 20 years right now, as I don't want to say as somebody who didn't grow up here, 
I don't really view it so much as a rivalry. It's really kind of a single culture, single market. You do kind of, you do have a little, I, I'd call it more of a friendly rivalry. Um, you know, I like to think we're winning on a lot of aspects, uh, although the numbers might not agree. But I, you know, I think it's healthy to have a little bit of it. I think it doesn't man, it doesn't manifest itself in the unhealthy ways that it has in the past, where they would compete for companies, compete for funding. You know, there's a little of that, but it's more, it's more kind of joint. Um, and I think really that came out of, you know, you had these different immigrants from different parts of the world that would settle in different, the different cities, right? So you saw really the culture that really kind of grew out of that. Um, that's going away a little bit. And I think that's just because, um, you know, new people are coming in and, uh, you know, culture evolves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and refresh my memory. Uh, what's the relative size between the two different cities and then also the size of the population size of the entire metro area? Sure. Let's go big. So Minneapolis, St. Paul, we're about 3.5 million, roughly, depending on how you want to draw your boundaries. You're looking at about three, three and a half million. Minneapolis is about 400,000. And um, St. Paul, I think we're, we're right around three. Okay. So Minneapolis, though, has such a large, so much larger, like downtown presence, such a larger uh, worker base. I mean, probably two, three times size than what we have of just kind of workers coming in to work. So it, it very much is the wealthier, kind of more vibrant, more urban place. Although St. Paul really does have some areas that are gems. We, um, back in the 50s and 60s, we really didn't have the money or wealth to tear things down. So we're, we've really been gifted with a lot of beautiful old buildings, uh, some of which have been perfectly restored and really helped the urban fabric, some of which are falling down. But, you know, we didn't level them. We didn't as much. We didn't level it for parking lots and the like. So I think that really kind of gives St. Paul that. As Mark Twain once said, uh, St. Paul is the last city of the East and Minneapolis is the first city of the West. <laughs> And I think that's interesting, too, because you got the Mississippi, right, which kind of essentially cuts the country in half. Right. Um, so geographically, I think it's partially true. But culturally as well, I think uh, it also holds true to a certain degree. Yeah. And I pulled a, I pulled up the map here with uh, St. Paul sort of highlighted Minneapolis uh, just off to the west there. And uh, you kind of see that, you know, both cities are oriented with the river running right through it. And I, I know that when we, you and I were talking about doing the bike ride at the, um, at, at the Congress uh, that was going to be hosted there in St. Paul and, and, and doing uh, some events there in Minneapolis, you know, we were talking about, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll do a bike ride and lead a bike ride from St. Paul over to Minneapolis. Remind me how, how, what the distance is, it, you know, obviously depending on which route you take, but yeah, it, it seems like it's very rideable. It's about 10, 12 miles between the two downtowns. Okay. So, you know, it back in the day, I mean, when the cities were both starting up in the 1840s, 1850s, that was a day's trip. Right, right. Now it's a yeah. bike ride. Now it's know? a bike ride. Yeah. Which is, which is wild to think about. Which is yeah, wild to think yeah. About. Totally, totally. And I do happen to have the uh, the bike route uh, layer turned on here on Google Maps. And so you can see the amount of green that just pops. And and that's one of the things that, that Minneapolis is, is well known for. And I'm not sure on St. Paul, you can let me know, is that it has a reputation of being a pretty darn bike friendly place, you know, consider all things considered in North America. Yeah, I'm going to get some hate on this, but I think St. Paul is actually a better bike city. And one of the reasons is, is I think that despite our hills, inconvenient, uh, get an e-bike if you can't handle them, right. is that on our grid network, we just have so many more slow streets. We have so many more streets that connect specifically east-west that just don't have a lot of cars on it. So even without bike infrastructure, as you can zoom in, we, you know, we actually, we have a fair amount of bike infrastructure and it's growing every day and hats off to the, you know, public works in the city for, for making that happen. But, you know, really even off some of these major bike routes, like if it's busy, dude, you can go two blocks South and, uh, you know, just coast down with no car traffic. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that too, because, you know, when we zoom in, we see 
the the green dashed uh, lines that that show up, which basically means bicycle friendliness. Uh, it, this sort of is a is a good you know street residential street you know that would be conducive for riding, but there's not necessarily uh, any infrastructure for cycling. And it, I was visiting the the Minneapolis area one summer. Uh, I don't remember which visit that was, and I was on some major bike route there in Minneapolis. Uh, and it was also, it was a bike lane, bus lane, shared lane on a major road. And I'm playing Frogger with, with the bus in this, in this bike bus lane. And I'm like, this is BS. And so I went a couple blocks to the, to, you know, parallel and found just this absolutely delightful, residential street with zero infrastructure for bikes, but there was zero traffic. And, and so it was, and because of the grid network, you were able to just you, you roll through a leafy, quiet neighborhood in, in, and you're just like, this is delightful. And it's one of the things that I harp on here on the channel is that I think cities oftentimes do themselves a disservice uh, by uh, you know, with their bike network planning is they spend all this time really, you know, emphasizing, okay, this is where our bike lanes are and everything. Whereas two blocks over, you, you may have a much more delightful experience that still has good connectivity. If it's an older city that has a grid network that could be really enhanced Do you know, maybe you know, maybe some traffic diversion, maybe some traffic calming if necessary, but inherently in a lot of these cities, it's just, it's, it's ready to go. It's, you know, two blocks over from a bike lane, you've got a much more pleasant, especially as a dad, you would be like, oh yeah, no, I feel more comfortable riding with my kids on this quiet residential street than I do where there's a bike lane you know, even though there's a bike lane, it's still right next to 30 mile per hour or, or more traffic. Even if even if you've got a buffer, right, it's like you still, especially with kids or, you know, one of the problems that I have with buffers when you're pulling a trailer is like you kind of have to be super careful with turns. So it is easier to go a block or two over. I think what we you need to do as a city uh, when you have issues like that is you have to find where are the busy roads that these off streets have, right? These, that street that's a block or two off, where are the busy crossings and how do we facilitate better crossing of those busy streets? Exactly. And I think that's that's the huge thing, right? Like how do we just get people safely across the busy ones yeah. and let them go about their way? Yeah, and a great example is, you know, maybe you're on one of these, you know, quiet residential streets here and you come uh, up to a, a, a busier street that maybe even has a bicycle lane on it. It's like, how do you facilitate that crossing? Uh, I know that uh, the, the city of Fort Collins in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, they've done a really good job of activating their uh, neighborhood greenways and their residential streets that are, you know, basically quiet, low volume streets. And then when they interact with those busier strodes and arterials, they really work at creating uh, safe crossings, you know, in, in that environment and prioritizing that, you know, bike and ped movement of getting across those streets. Because, you know, to your point, that's the biggest challenge uh, of really facilitating that as part of the bicycle network of, you know, l leaning into these neighborhood bikeways and, and whatnot is how do you get past those or, or across those busy streets? Yeah. And I, my comments aren't meant to disparage any city from doing bike infrastructure trails on your busy roads or your arterials. You, yeah, have you need to, to do that. both. Yeah. Spe specifically if you have commercial areas, but just saying that like as a dad now, it's, you want to go to those, you want to go two or three blocks off and uh, take the, the slow route. Well, and not only that too, in, in Minneapolis, I'm not sure about St. Paul, but Minneapolis, I know does a really good job of their off street network of pathways where you can connect uh, to meaningful destinations. And at the same time, ride next to a delightful lake, and through a park, which is a, another great thing that uh, uh, Jason Slaughter with Not Just Bikes, uh, the YouTube channel, uh, showed me a couple summers ago when I was visiting him in Amsterdam. I wasn't sure what he was going to do, he, but he said, OK, come on, let's go. And and he he took us on a ride which linked together like four or five different 
uh, parks. And so we spent a lot of time off of the street network and in the off street network of pathways to prove that in Amsterdam, they do both. They do the on street, you know, bike lanes as well as the off street network uh, incredibly well. We do a little bit of both. I certainly not to the, uh, uh, to the level that Amsterdam does, I'm sure. But um, I was a bike commuter prior to the pandemic, and I work from home three, four days a week now. Um, and it's a little harder with the school pickup. Uh, but that said, you know, I was for the longest time I was a bike commuter, and for my uh, my route going downtown Minneapolis, it was about six and a half miles. Over about five and a half of it was on an off street trail. Which oh wow! Was fantastic. Okay. And honestly, if I had to battle with traffic for six straight miles, I probably would have rode the bus every day and I wouldn't have been a bike commuter. Yeah. Uh, but just by allowing that to, to exist. So obviously half of that route was along the Mississippi river, which is always nice to see in the morning. But even that aside, just being able to have a separated trail, you can go faster. You just, it's more comfortable and uh, not dealing with cars. is uh, it's a great thing when you're on a bike. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree, too. And I, I guess I didn't realize. So you, you, your office is actually in Minneapolis then? That's right. I live in St. Paul, work in Minneapolis. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. All right. That's good. Uh, and, and you're working for the county, though, right? Yeah, I work for uh, our housing and economic development department. So we do a lot of planning. Uh, we, we do a lot of planning around uh, kind of transit improvements. Uh, we, uh, we, do, we also have some programs called Henneman Planning Grants and the Business District Initiative, which I work on, where we try to help small business nodes throughout the county, preferably kind of on, on our main streets. And uh, for Hennepin Planning Grants, if any city needs, say, some planning assistance to do something that meets our goals, such as uh, improve walkability, improve density, improve transit access, uh, improve stormwater and a whole host of other things. Uh, we'll step in and we'll, we'll help them on that uh, to try to solve their problem because Minneapolis is there. Uh, we also have the city of Bloomington in the county, which is rather large, but most of the cities in the county are pretty small. We're pretty fractured suburban uh, landscape. So, uh, you know, you might okay. have a city of 25,000 people. They, they're not like the city of Minneapolis or Bloomington where they're, doing large planning redevelopment projects on a regular basis. So occasionally those things will come up and they'll say, okay, County, how can you help us with both resources and helping us hit these various redevelopment goals? So, uh, Hopefully I explain that without too much government speak. No, no, but, no, that, that's good. And, and that's and really I, what I'm, I work on. And I'm getting in the inference is that St. Paul is actually in a different County. Is that correct? We are, we're in Ramsey County. One of the great things, one of the great things about my role is uh, I work in Minneapolis and Hennepin County, and I just don't talk about politics or anything that happens over there. I just let it go. Yeah. And then I go hog wild on the Ramsey County, St. Paul side. And we have that political division that hopefully word doesn't get across. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. That's yeah. great. Well, hey, let's uh, let's play a little bit more uh, of your stand up, because uh, uh, one, one, of, one of the things that I love about how you 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 frame this up is you you, you do say how much you love St. Paul. So I love in St. Paul. I love St. Paul. I live in Island Park, which is the most boring neighborhood yes. in a boring city. <laughs> our, our, uh, there we go. our hottest new venue is the Pickleball Court. It's not a joke, it's just been really busy since the Baker Square closed. <laughs> the only thing that was interesting that actually happened I forgot about the Baker Square, yeah. I, I, uh, so what is Baker Square? <laughs> Baker Square, every every like town or region has this. It's Baker Square was our version of where every senior citizen went like Wednesday for breakfast. Okay. That's what it was. It was that it was like our like pancake house. And you I went in the last time that I went in there, you know, uh it's probably thirty eight years old and I was the youngest person in that place. Right, right. You know, it was like one of those places. Um, I love it. So that's it. And uh if you keep going, actually there's a I think this joke I'm trying to think where this joke goes, but I think well, it goes let's find to out. a local 
happened by me was that there was a pizza place called Papa Dimitri's that got busted as a drug front. When I heard that information, I was shocked. I had no idea they sold pizza. <laughs> Yeah, we can leave it at that. <laughs> that, was, that was the... Dude, Pop, I got to tell you about Papa Dimitri's. So Papa Dimitri's had, it was this one, you know, it was like Russian pizza. Some, you know, you know, Russia and pizza, you know, it's not something you're like, oh yeah, that goes together like peanut butter and jelly. So they, they opened this place, Papa Dimitri's, and it's in this great like walkable little node, but it was never open. They had the weirdest hours. Uh, and you'd read the reviews online, and they'd say, "This tastes like Papa Murphy." Do you know Papa Murphy's? Oh yeah, take yeah, a yeah, 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 Turns yeah. out it was Papa Murphy's. They were. Uh, <laughs> it was a front. They were going to the nearby. <laughs> it was a drug front. They were going to the yeah. nearby Papa Murphy's, placing whatever order you made online, <laughs> <laughs> cooking it, and then delivering it. But it was actually better than that because people would call up and it was basically like a mar- illegal marijuana delivery service where you would call up and order the oh. whatever pizza. Yeah, they yeah. would show up with a box, but it would be marijuana. Um, they were eventually busted uh, as a drug front. But here's what was fascinating about it. And this is what I can never imagine happening in my life. It was a, uh, a son, his mother, and his grandmother, three generation drug front. Oh, wow. Can you imagine operating a drug front with your grandmother? <laughs> or my mom yeah, yeah I, could, you know. I was like geez man we're shutting down this family business uh, yeah yeah <laughs> anyways, this is pretty wild man uh dude i'd well, love to what's the status with marijuana these days are they one of the states that have legalized it you know the state of minnesota has legalized it it's uh we're i think hopefully i don't want to say hopefully i don't really smoke or anything but like sure, yeah. next year uh, it should be legal. However, okay. you can buy it in gummy or pop form. Okay. So you can just okay. buy like a like a soda or a seltzer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got but the THC in there. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say because, yeah, that's it, – the world has changed a lot, in, you know, since uh, since the day of, you know, of complete uh, abolition, you know, the war on drugs kind of thing. It's kind of interesting what we're seeing here is we're seeing um, – like from the state legislature, this huge this push still to like further regulate right. smoking and cigarettes. At the same time, we're like encouraging marijuana shops to like pop up uh, at the same time. Well, and and we're seeing as you just mentioned with gummies, we're seeing a lot more of the application of uh, of edibles being you know as as the preferred delivery mechanism of the the THC and 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 of that uh, and yeah because. It, if you're burning it, it's still bad for your lungs, dude. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> From yeah, a public you know, health perspective. And it's interesting. You'll see the stuff marketing is like sugar-free, gluten-free uh, THC gummies, right? So it's like for the health conscious, I guess it's good, you know? And it's one of those things that, you know, I guess legalization opens doors for those markets to happen. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Well, speaking of legal stuff and all that, I understand that there's some really cool uh, things being presented uh, at the state level in in uh, Minnesota uh, regarding uh, a variety of different things, but including uh, parking minimums. Talk a little bit about that. It's kind of exciting seeing what you guys have got going on. We got two things going on in the state of Minnesota. One is the removal of, of parking minimums for most all uses. That would just be a total statewide ban on cities enacting parking minimums. Uh, and then we also have a separate bill, which I would call the missing middle bill, uh, which prohibits cities from, I, I forget where the language stands right now, but it would be in all residential areas to permit one to three or one to four units on a what would be defined as a standard city lot. I believe it also does a few things with um, accessory dwelling units to legalize those statewide in pretty much all residential areas with a few exceptions. But it also goes even a little further, and it prevents cities from doing various mandates that kill housing, such as requiring that a facade be 100% brick, uh, things like that. So, you know, I agree. I, going through, I agree with about 85%. Of, uh, of what they're trying to do on that one. There are some uh, small issues that I have with it, uh, such as um, 
eliminating in housing developments that requirement that there be retail at the ground level. So I think that my personal opinion is you don't want to put retail if it's going to be vacant, but if it's on a large commercial street, I don't see any issue, uh, you know, mandating that on a case by case basis. But generally, with the exception of a few of those small kind of nuanced things, uh, it's kind of an exciting, kind of an exciting place. I feel like this is the stuff I've been arguing for uh, and writing blogs about and telling jokes about for the last 10, 15 years. And uh, it's finally started to pick up steam. So it's good to see that happen. And I think if it doesn't happen this year, there's a good chance it'll probably happen next year. You know, the legislative sausage making, I try not to follow the day to day. It's a good way to get gray hairs or pull your hair out, trying to get obsessed with that stuff. But there's smart people on uh, you know both sides of the aisle that are supporting these efforts, which is great to see a bipartisan in today's day and age, to see a bipartisan effort to try to get more housing built, to try to be more flexible, try to get a little more density in cities. And it's going to be a big win for places like St. Paul and Minneapolis, but I also see it as being a big win for a lot of our rural communities right? where they don't have a lot of money to expand their infrastructure. They're not seeing huge demand, so they can take a single family home that's, for example, in a traditional neighborhood, and now that can be converted to a duplex, or they can add that accessory dwelling unit above a garage if they like. Right now, in most places, that's prohibited and that's unfortunate so i think this is a great first this is a great step in the right direction for the state so um and if it passes we'll uh we'll see the fruits of our labor in 20 30 years so it's kind of well, how these things work so i'm i'm hearing though though too that there's also some relatively quicker turnaround in terms of the amount of of housing that is being built. And, you know, because I believe that, you know, maybe it was just the city of Minneapolis, I'm not sure. But if I'm remembering some of the headlines correctly, is that they're, you know, they kind of, you know, opened up the floodgates and made it legal to build more housing much more dynamically. And that's really resulting in some positive outcomes. Is Am I getting that right? No, you've nailed it. Uh, Specifically in the city of Minneapolis, I mean, a tremendous amount of housing was built in the last 10 years. And a lot of that is, uh, you know, you can thank the city leaders for allowing that to happen by opening up zoning, allowing more density, removing parking minimums in most places in the city. And uh, you saw a flood of new units. And amongst places like Austin, Texas, for example, that saw, I guess now coming down, but places like Texas that saw rates shoot up or what have you, our rates, our, our rental rates have been relatively flat. Um, but if you consider in things like inflation, uh, that's a big win for renters. Yeah. It's been a big and we have seen renters. quite a few units coming online, uh, you know, post pandemic, and we are now seeing a flattening too, and a slight dip in our, in our as well. Uh, how about be making it legal? You mentioned businesses and uh, first floor retail. How about making it much more legal to be able to have a mixing of uses? I mean, I'd love to see more cities embracing the concept of, oh, yeah, no, it's not illegal anymore to have like a corner grocery store in a market. Yeah. Yeah, that's something in St. Paul specifically. We're doing a missing middle study right now that's uh, working its way through. And uh, that's part of it, right? Opening up uh, those possibilities to to open that corner store. I know that's a tough business and it's tough to make it happen, but I think that there's no reason that we shouldn't allow it. Well, I mean, and especially cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul, you have a, a, a historic core and you have plenty of examples of older neighborhoods where it's not just the corner store. It's also you've got a neighborhood pub and you've got other businesses that are within easy walking distance, biking distance. Um, And so what's nice about cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul is you don't have to look very far to find examples of neighborhoods that are served by these businesses. And so being able to say, hey, we just want to make it, we want to codify that it's legal to do this again. And the reason why is, hey, look over there. We've got some good stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that we're, we're making progress on it. I don't, I don't, again, like I'm not sure the market's there often for a lot of the corner stores, but I think you open it up and you give it enough time and you'll see those things evolve, right? One of the problems that we have in our cities, we haven't let them evolve. Right. Uh, we basically frozen them in time. The city of St. Paul in the 1970s essentially downzoned the entire city. 
where something like 75% of all of the land that you could build a house on was exclusively single family homes. Exactly. Fast forward 60 years and everyone's like, you know, why is it expensive to live here? It's like, well, you know, we've been building 40 new houses a year max. Meanwhile, you know, you've got this demand for jobs, demand for population, et cetera, et cetera. So just allowing to create a framework that will allow things to develop organically or more organically, I think is going to be a big win for everybody. Well, it, and, and to your point, it, uh, I guess a big part of this too is let's not make it illegal. I mean, talk about a free market. Maybe you don't have to like worry about, well, is there a, a market for a corner store here? Let the entrepreneurs figure that out. Just don't, just don't, you know, tie their, you know, their, their hands behind their back. You know, it's yeah, like, absolutely. you know, let's, let's go back to where we can have a mix, uh, a mix of uses, you know, that can come up organically. Yeah. Before we made a lot of these reforms, I was still on the planning commission and you'd see one of these cases come up where you just want to pull your hair out, right? Right. You'd have, you'd have a building that it used to be a corner store with an apartment on top and they turned the main floor into an apartment and now they want to turn it back into a corner store, right? The building was built as a corner store and operated as a corner store for the majority of the building's existence, except for the last like 20 years, right? It'll be a 120 year old building, hundred of the years where it was a corner store. The recent, last 20, it was not. Yeah. And then you look at our code and now you're in an awkward position as a planning commissioner of voting against it because the code just says that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the thing people don't understand about planning commission. Like you, you make a judgment based on the rules, right? Whether you like those rules or not, you're making a judgment on the rules. And it really, it, frankly, it stinks having to look somebody in the eye like an applicant and say, I'm sorry you can't open a corner store in a building that was clearly designed as a corner store – Right. Because 40 years ago, <laughs> somebody didn't like corner stores. It's not like this is a scientifically like driven yeah, yeah. decision. They yeah. just, you know, they just did it. And, and, uh, and to be I'm honest, sorry. you know, to, to be fair to, you know, the, the rule makers of the day, it probably wasn't even anything against corner stores. It was probably just something that, you know, and cities did this across the continent, around the nation, even around the world, is they were copying and pasting you know, zoning codes and, and whatnot, just because, oh, this is the modern thing to do. This is how we now separate uses. And it may not have been anything because it's, to be quite honest, those neighborhoods that have mixed uses and corner stores and a pub down at the end of the block are some of the most beloved and desirable places in our cities. Yeah. Yeah. I think you bring up a good point. And I see this with a lot of policy. I don't think that the, you know, Banning corner stores was probably not the intention of the down zoning, right? That wasn't the intention, but it was it was certainly the result, right? Yeah. And I kind of I, I do always think of that, like what are what are the negative consequences of some of the policies that we're pushing today going to be? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it's really hard to look forward five years, more or less twenty years down the road to see what those are. So. Yeah. Yeah. So like everybody. Yeah. So, so how long have you been on the planning commission? Five years now, five okay. years. And, it's been, and how, uh, does, how, how does that work out? Or is this a lifetime appointment or are you, uh, nah, or, nah, do you I have think, to, is it, is an appointment or is it an elected position? It's, it's an appointment. Um, thankfully not elected. Uh, it's, uh, I think, man, I want to say they're three year terms and you get three of them. So you got nine years max. Okay. So I got three more years, I think. In me, okay. and that's about all I think I can put up with. So yeah, yeah. A near decade on the like, planning commission is about yeah, about much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you you mentioned it earlier is that it's been much more encouraging lately because you're starting to see the transformation of some of those rules and those codes to be a little bit more uh, progressive and and helpful. Dude, the best thing that we did for limiting my workload on the planning commission was getting rid of parking minimums in the city of St. Paul Yeah. every week prior to in 2021, I think is when we, or the end of 2020, early 2021, 21 is when we removed parking minimums, man, our, the amount of agenda items that we've had has been cut in half 
there was always something silly, right? Like an apartment building, they met all the codes, except they needed like eight parking spaces or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would see everybody who hated an apartment building show up to that testimony, you know, and argue against it. Um, our workload has been cut in half because you just don't see those small, weird parking variances anymore. They, they don't exist. And that's honestly been I, not only has it been great for me, it's not that I'm lazy and I want fewer things, but you, you want to send people through the process a lot less. And I think it's been great for staff. Now you don't have one staff person writing a 10 page report doing public hearings and the whole works. So somebody can get a variance for three parking spaces. So it's been great as far as less work, which is what you ideally what you want, right? You want people to be doing projects by right. And it's been a huge win. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, it, and I like this little knock knock joke here that we have at the uh, on the landing page for uh, the podcast episode that you did, uh, you know, here with the the planning commission uh, podcast. And it's like knock knock, who's there? It's commissioner, commissioner who? <laughs> the commissioner who clearly didn't read their packet. <laughs> so. Idiots. You know, I'm on, so we have a, we have committees. I'm on the zoning committee and then the planning commission for the zoning committee. It's smaller and everybody reads their packet. Everybody knows exactly what's going on. And I like that, but man, you get to that planning commission as a whole and who, you know, some people, you know, some people have full-time, you know, they have full-time jobs. Like it's, right, yeah. you know, but they're learning about the zoning issue as it arrives. And it makes for some frustrating, long conversations sometimes when, uh, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to close us out, uh, what's been one of the most encouraging things that you have witnessed uh, either, you know, in your job or in your advocacy work or maybe even your role as a, a planning commissioner? Uh, what's one of the most encouraging things that you've seen in the last you know handful of years other than what we've already talked about with, uh, you know, the 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 parking minimums? Sure. Uh, so a few things. One, uh, adding or improving sidewalks, uh, shared use trails, etc. That's just part of the process. The question isn't whether we should, at least where I live, it's not, should we do them? It's more a question of how are we going to pay for them? How are we going to afford to do that extra work? Which I think is a, it's a good spot to be, you know, because we, you get over that hurdle of having to fight over every single project, right? It's just, it's part of what we do and we do it. And over time, we're really going to build out that network and we're going to have a lot of better uh, bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure. That's been a huge win. Uh, I think that um, locally and now at the state level, what we talked about having just honestly small changes to statewide zoning laws. I think that's, it's just encouraging to see that it's encouraging to see something that has been uh, bugging me for the last decade and see people who are elected, people who have power, uh, talk about these things. Um, so it's encouraging just to see that. And, uh, I think, uh, you know, give another 20 years, we're gonna, we're gonna be in a good spot as far as, um, uh, you know, I think, I think the big challenge, one of the things that's encouraging to me is a lot of our city neighborhoods are doing tremendously well, right? Our downtown with COVID work from home and locally in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we, you know, we've had some other issues. I'm sure that you guys have, you guys have heard about, you know, I'm not so sure about what we're going to do with the downtowns, but it's amazing to see the neighborhoods that are all adjacent to that. Just it, it seems like we're thriving almost better than ever. So so that's been that's been really, really encouraging to see that kind of like small scale mid city density urbanism. Uh, I feel like it's really come alive. And I think that's um, that's really fantastic place to be. Yeah. Well, when it comes to like having the money to invest in uh, active mobility, you mentioned sidewalks, you mentioned shared use paths and things of that, that nature. Oftentimes the 800 pound gorilla in the room is the tremendous amount of money being spent on expanding highways and roadways and adding more lane miles. Uh, are you guys made it over the hump there or is that still the battle is it you know there you know folks you know the cities and and towns are like you know hey our, our there's no no more left in our pocket sorry we can't improve the the sidewalks and the pathways and et cetera, the bike lanes we just don't have any money and oh by the way the next item on the agenda is we're approving you know 4.5 billion dollars to expand the this highway 
do we still have those issues with our DOT, right? You know, within Minneapolis and St. Paul, you do have leadership that'll say, no, we're not going to give you municipal consent to expand I-94 through the center of our town, right? So, so you do have city leadership that has made that decision, and it's a great one, one that I support. But you're right, you know, you go out to some suburban areas or even rural areas, you see this a ton, kind of where I'm originally from, Mankato, man, they just spent, I think it was like $44 million on a half mile bypass that's going to save people eight seconds. And it's like, what are you doing, guys? What are you doing? Yeah. The return on that is just so low, right? That money could obviously either better be spent elsewhere or honestly nowhere at all. You know, I'd almost rather them not have that money. So you still see that at the DOT level, but at least here, your county and city level, most places, um, if they're not on the same page, they're getting pretty darn close to being on the same page, which is, you know, which is really encouraging. And that's something that I probably could not have said 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. When you're looking at, especially as a parent, you know, who's out there, you know, trying to get your kids around, do uh, embracing active mobility, um, how safe do the streets feel? Do you, do you get the sense that, you know, that the city is in, in, and county and, and other municipalities are working hard to bring motor vehicle speeds down and make the streetscapes uh, a little bit safer and, and kinder so that you can feel like you, you know, you can get to school, you can get to the parks, you can get to friends' houses by walking and biking? You know, I'm thankful I live in the city of St. Paul. I think our city leadership, we got a great director of public works that's re- that really does some fantastic things. And they've got a good staff, and I think that is happening. I've also, my wife and I, we chose to live in an area that was pretty walkable. Um, you know, we're very close to school. We're very close to the kids after school. So um, on nice days, unlike today, uh, you know, we generally walk the kids to and from school, or excuse me, at least from school. Uh, to school, we got an early start time, so we're oftentimes rushing out, uh, rushing out the door. But um, no, I mean, I feel I feel very safe usually walking and biking within the city. However, you live in a place long enough, you know where to avoid, right? I know not to go by Highway Five or West Seven, and I know not to bike along Snelling Avenue or Mindot 50, Highway Fifty One, as they call it, right? So really where I live, the city and county have gotten their acts together. It's really that state DOT that will treat highways through cities like it's in a rural area where there there aren't conflicts, where there aren't people. So that's still a battle. I think the DOT is slightly getting better, but uh, it is not happening as fast as the way that the city and the county has moved. Yeah, yeah. Small steps. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it is, right? Small yeah, steps. Yeah. So. Small steps, small steps. And Nate, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Nate Hood. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. Become an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do so. Just navigate over to activetowns.org and click on that support button. There's many different options options, including Patreon, buy me a coffee, and oh yeah, YouTube super thanks right here. You can also make a donation to the nonprofit. Uh, Hey, every little bit helps and is much appreciated. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.